special pleasure to have Clancy Rowley today from Princeton. Princeton is also where he got his undergraduate degree and then uh, moved on to California to get a doctoral degree from uh, Caltech. And Clancy has uh, accumulated lots of awards, uh, NSF Career Award, an Air Force Young Investigator Award, and he's also a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's an expert in uh, dynamical systems, control theory, model reduction, Koopman theory, and he's going to tell us today how to find simplicity in complex flows. So Clancy, over to you and welcome. Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so I just thought, I thought I'd start out with an example uh, to motivate what I'm going to talk about today. And this is an example I did uh, many years ago when I was a graduate student. Uh, and the goal was to look at the, this flow past the cavity and uh, this flow, I'll play a little movie here. So the flow oscillates. If you look at the top, top movie, that's the natural flow. So there you get a little shear layer flapping over a cavity. Uh, and this produces a lot we, of acoustic, wave, see, acoustic we, wave. We can actually not see the movie. Oh, really? Oh, that's, no. Are you skipping oh, the... It's playing in my window, but let me, let me try. Um, let me try. Oh, here it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, but that's OK. You know what? Let me try this. Uh, what if I just share my whole window here instead of uh, that um, one screen? How do I share the whole window here? Desktop, okay. And now let's try just playing. Now, now do you see the movie? Perfect, yes, thank you. Okay, good. All right. And can you see my pointer? Yes, we can see the pointer now. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So excellent. So, all right. So the, here's this movie of this cavity flow. You see the shear layer flapping up and down. And when this flapping hits the back corner, it makes a lot of acoustic waves, which uh, interact with the shear layer and create this resonance that you see here. Okay. So we wanted to control this because this happens in vehicles like your, your car. If you open the sunroof uh, or the window, it can buff it like this. Uh, aircraft have this phenomenon if you have a wheel well or uh, in a, like a bomber, a weapons bay has this. So we wanted to control this and remove these oscillations. Well, uh, we like model-based control. Uh, so if you do model-based control, or the, this, this full system has 2 million states. So this little simulation I did many years ago had half a million grid points. There are four flow variables, so that's 2 million states. Uh, and that's just too big to, for at least at the time, for our resources to design a controller for a system that big. So uh, what we did was we developed a low dimensional model with only two states and designed a controller based on that. And the bottom figure shows how that controller works. So let's play the movie again. Uh, and what we were doing, we were sensing the pressure at the back wall here, uh, putting that into our controller and the controller was uh, providing a signal to an actuator, which here was just a little vertical body force. So if you watch that little circle, you'll see little things, subtle things happening to this flow. So that's our actuation. There's feedback loop here and we're able to actually stabilize the shear layer and eliminate these oscillations completely. Uh, and this, it's a pretty low Reynolds number flow, uh, but uh, okay, so we were able to do this. So when you, know, when you first see this, you might think, wow, that's amazing, you know, two million states down to two states, how in the world is that possible uh, and to get anything useful with only two states? But when you look at it a second time, you think, well, actually that's not so surprising at all because when you look at the movie, the main feature you see is oscillation, right? This is flapping up and down. Uh, and oscillations, we know, uh, can be modeled very easily with two states, like a pendulum. If you take the, the angle and the angular velocity, those are two states, which, and those, you can write easy equations of motion that describe that oscillation. So that's really all that's going on here with this model is we're describing this as an oscillation with two states. But this is quite a powerful tool because then it allows you to uh, use other techniques like control design to design this feedback controller to stabilize this. Okay, so what, what uh, one of the themes I'm gonna show is some uh, procedures for getting these models, these very reduced order models uh, in, in a, a general way. Okay, and here's some uh, flows I'll, I'll look at um, as little test problems. So the first one is a linearized channel flow here. So it's flow in a box. Um, the second is a jet and cross flow. Uh, and then the third is a T-junction and the fourth is a separation bubble. Okay, so let's... Um, start with a linearized channel flow. And the, and the technique I'm gonna show here is the proper orthogonal decomposition, which is POD and Galerkin projection. And it's sort of a, a basic technique that a lot of this model reduction uh, uses. I'm sure many of you from, are familiar with this technique. 
but here's a, just an overview of what it is. So uh, let's say we have some high dimensional data here. Uh, are these little points, uh, these little data points are points in some, it's supposed to be high dimensional space. So of course it's only drawn in a three dimensional space. And the idea was we want to project these onto some low dimensional subspace. So that's the blue plane that's labeled as S here. Okay, so how would you project the dynamics? So if you take one of these points, dynamics give you a direction in which that point should move. Uh, well, that direction might not be in the, in the plane, in the subspace. So all you do with projection, Galerkin projection, is you just project that vector onto the, onto the subspace, very simple. Um, but the point I wanna make here is actually there's, there's really two choices that are going on when you do this. Uh, the first is of course the subspace S, the blue plane you need to decide what subspace you're gonna project onto. But the second is that gray line, the direction of projection. Uh, now it's easy, the, the natural thing to do is choose the gray line to be orthogonal to the blue plane, at least if you have an inner product that uh, defines what orthogonal means, but that's not necessary. In fact, you might do better to uh, project, say along that green direction, and you get different dynamics. It'd be the same subspace, the same data, uh, the same high dimensional dynamical system, but different low dimensional dynamics. Uh, and in this case, the green line seems to better fit the data. This is just a cartoon here, but this is showing that you really can get different dynamics with different directions of projection. And in some cases that can be quite important. So there, point is there are two choices here, subspace and the direction of projection. Okay, so what is POD? POD lets you determine the subspace, the blue plane from data. Uh, so it finds a subspace of a given dimension you specify that best fits the data uh, in, in the sense that it minimizes the error in the projection. So in this case, it gives you uh, directions. So these, these arrows denote directions, V1 and V2. Uh, you could think of those as kind of the, the principal vectors of this ellipsoid that, uh, is, that your data spans. And those two vectors will span the subspace S. So that'll define the subspace S. And those vectors in POD are called POD modes. Uh, this is the same as principal component analysis, if, if you haven't heard the word POD. So the word of caution is that these modes are optimal for capturing the data, but they might not be optional, op optimal for capturing the dynamics. And the reason is that low energy directions or just subtle differences might be very important to get the dynamics right. And to illustrate that, I, I thought I'd show this uh, shear flow, this uh, linearized channel flow, which seems like it should be quite a simple uh, system to model. So we're gonna linearize the Navier-Stokes equations about uh, a, a a, a laminar parabolic profile. Uh, so my pointer is now vanished, but the, in that picture you see the top wall is a wall, the bottom wall is a wall, the other, the side walls are all periodic and there's flow in the direction of the arrow. And all I'm gonna try to do is model the evolution of a particular perturbation, the one you see there. So there's a little perturbation in vertical velocity and you see the flow parameters there. So what happens in this flow? Well, actually Peter Schmidt has, has studied these flows for a long time and was one of the people really to identify this as a really important mechanism. Uh, the system is stable, this linear system is stable, but you get this perturbation before it decays away, it grows a large amount. I mean, here by a factor of 35, this is the Reynolds number 2000. So you see it eventually decays, the system is stable, but first it has this large transient growth and you see the structures that emerge there uh, pointed to by those arrows. So all I'm gonna to try to do with the low dimensional model is capture this phenomenon, this large transient growth before the decay, just for this one perturbation. So if you gather all that data uh, uh, and then compute these POD modes, you find that the first five modes capture over 99% of the energy in this flow, and the first 10 over 99.9%. Uh, so this looks like POD should work beautifully for this flow. I mean, five modes should work great, 10 modes even better. Uh, but let's see how this works. So if we take the first three modes, which you see capture also the, the large, a very large share of the energy, you get this little, uh, this uh, kinetic energy growth that's shown in the red curve, which is nowhere near the factor of 35 growth that we see in the full, in the full system, which is the black curve. Uh, so this didn't work so well. Well, what if you take the first five modes, which captured 99.7% of the energy, you get the same curve as the red curve. It doesn't work well at all, even though these modes captured nearly all the energy, 99.7%. Well, 
here was what my uh, patient grad student found that if you take the first three modes and then also add the 10th mode, which you see there, okay, now you get the green curve, which has at least better kinetic energy growth, still does some funny things at later times. But if you take those, the first three modes, the 10th mode and the 17th mode, a very low energy mode, then you get the blue curve, which actually looks pretty good. It, it's not perfect, but it's a pretty good model, uh, matches that black curve pretty well. So what have we seen? This, an order, a model with five modes, if you take modes one, two, three, 10, and 17, that works much better than a five mode model with the most energetic modes. So, you know, the conclusion is that some low energy modes like modes 10 and 17 can be very important to get the dynamics right. Uh, and you can't just naively use the most energetic ones, even if they capture a huge fraction of the energy, like over 99% does not always work well. Well, this is a little bit frustrating. You'd like to have a, a, a method that works a little better than this than needing to hunt around and find low energy modes. So what went wrong here, you know, as we said, the most energetic states are not always the best ones to keep. Uh, and some states that have small energy can have a big effect on the flow. So in control theory, these concepts have names are known as controllability and observability. And the most controllable states are the ones with large energy. The most observable states have the largest sensitivity. Um, so there's a beautiful method called uh, balanced truncation that was developed uh, by Moore and presented in, in 1981 in which you can determine change of coordinates in which the states that are most controllable, the most energetic, are also the most observable. So you're the most sensitive to those. And then if you change those coordinates, then it's obvious what to do. You just truncate uh, states that are least controllable and observable. Uh, and there's a method called balanced POD uh, that is an approximation of balanced truncation that, is, that works, uh, that's computationally tractable for high dimensional systems. So if we try balanced POD, oh, and what does this, what does balanced POD do? Well, remember from the very first slide I showed, there are really two things you need to decide when you do this uh, projection. You need to decide on a subspace and a direction. So POD gives you one of these, the subspace. It doesn't give you the direction. Balanced POD gives you both of these. It gives you a subspace here spanned by some modes phi j, that's the kind of uh, flat, the horizontal plane shown here. And it also gives you some modes uh, psi j that determine the direction of the projection. That's the, those span the inclined plane there. Uh, and you can see the, you project along the direction orthogonal to that uh, plane. So that's the geometry of this. So how well does this work? Well, it works much better than POD. If you look at the, this, so this black curve is the original, uh, the full system's energy growth, you see growing to a factor of 35 of the original energy. The, the brown curve shows the, a three mode POD model that we showed earlier with just a tiny energy growth. Well, if you take even a two mode balanced POD model, you get the red curve, which is very, which is pretty good. And a three mode model nearly perfectly captures the, the energy. The only differences are at the very early times. Uh, and if you take more balanced modes, you get a better and better model. Uh, so this balanced model works much better uh, at least for this for this system with the large transient growth. Uh, this shows the energy you can, for this linear system, you can look at norms and you can see if you want to get the first uh, five POD modes perfectly, you need an eight mode balanced POD model. You need to, you need to keep 23 POD modes to get the, those, uh, the first, to correctly capture the first five POD modes with your reduced order model. Okay, uh, another thing that, that controls people like to look at a convenient tool is uh, Bode plots of frequency response. So this shows the frequency response, at least the, the maximum singular value of these models. And on the left, you see the POD models. And the feature I want you to see here is these peaks, these spurious peaks that happen uh, in these POD modes. And there's a variety of models keeping very different modes there, but they all have these spurious peaks. Th these indicate eigenvalues that are really close to the imaginary axis. Uh, and these are not gonna be the best models because if you perturb these models a little bit, those eigenvalues may be unstable. In fact, in many cases, these models are unstable, the, the POD models where the original system, the linear system we know was, was stable. It had large transient growth, but it was stable. On the right, you see the balance, the frequency response of the balanced models. And these don't have these features. They, they, you capture more of the features of this Bode plot as you keep more balancing modes, but you don't get this, these funny spurious peaks. So in this sense, these balanced models are more robust than the POD models. Okay, so that's all I wanna say about this first part of the talk. Uh, and the lesson learned is that even if you have uh, POD models that capture POD modes, capture 
a huge fraction of the energy, even over 99%. Uh, and POD cannot, can perform surprisingly poorly uh, uh, at getting a reduced order model. Um, and this actually, this bad behavior is typical for non-normal systems with this large transient growth, as happens frequently in, in shear flows. And the reason is that some low energy uh, directions, low energy perturbations uh, can, you can be very sensitive to that. They can be strongly observable. Okay, but if you use a method that balances these effects of controllability and observability, then these techniques perform well. Okay, so that wraps up the first part of this talk. Uh, next, I wanna move on to discuss this jet and cross flow. And the technique that I'll, I'll show there is uh, dynamic mode decomposition and Koopman modes. So this, uh, I got started in this problem with uh, this, this problem here that actually Peter Schmidt worked on with some folks from uh, KTH. So they were looking at the, I was not involved in this work, but they were looking at the flow, uh, a jet and cross flow here. So at the left, you see a picture of an instantaneous snapshot of this flow uh, and these, uh, these flow structures that are in the shear layer of this jet. Uh, you also see some near wall structures in the, in the little gray uh, ISO surface, with, which has a couple of bumps in it. And you see the blue and red uh, 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 patches of vorticity leaving near the, near the wall. So these are some features of this flow. Uh, and what, what these folks did uh, is uh, they found an unstable equilibrium, not an easy thing to calculate, but they found this and they linearized about this unstable equilibrium and wanted to see how, how well these, uh, these eigenvectors and eigenvalues described the full nonlinear flow. So they compute these global modes, these eigen, eigenfunctions, and compared the frequencies of those with observed frequencies. And what they found was that the, the mode uh, that coincides with these shear layer structures you see in along close to the jet are pretty well predicted, the frequency within 20%. But the near wall mode was way off. The frequency was way off, a factor of 2.5. So the conclusion was this linearization about this didn't really work very well for predicting the frequencies. Uh, okay, so, so what did we do with this? Well, we took this technique that Peter developed uh, and presented at APS in 2008 called dynamic mode de decomposition. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but I'll just say what it is. So it's uh, decomposition defined by an algorithm. You connect, to, you collect a bunch of snapshots of your data at subsequent times, zero, one, two, et cetera. And you assume that these data are linearly related. So there's some matrix A that can take you from uh, the state at time K to the state at time K plus one. And then you can use a clever Arnoldi-like algorithm to, to approximate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix A without ever computing the matrix explicitly. Uh, you just know these uh, uh, x naught, A times x naught, which is x1, A squared times x naught, which is x2, et cetera. And you can use this algorithm to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A, at least approximate them. Okay, so a hitch is that typically dynamics, at least for the neighbor Stokes equations, are nonlinear and the linear assumption does not hold. But let's see how this method works on this data set here. So if you just uh, take snapshots from this full simulation and compute these DMD eigenvectors, DMD modes, you see this, uh, the most high energy one uh, has this frequency, uh, non-dimensional frequency 0.14, which perfectly matches the, the frequency from the full simulation. And the structures look quite reasonable. Uh, you see these structures in the shear layer. There was also a low frequency mode, which also per nearly perfectly matches the frequency observed in the full data set. So this actually worked beautifully at, at, at finding these structures in a way that the linear, the linear stability theory did not work uh, nearly as well. Okay, so um, what happened here? Why did this work? So the linearization didn't capture the right, linearization by the equilibrium didn't capture the right behavior, but the DMD modes did capture the right frequencies and, and good structures. But DMD was somehow based on an assumption that the flow is linear. So this kind of seems contradictory here. Well, it works in this case because there's a linear system that fit the observed behavior, which was, again, kind of harking back to the first example, oscillations at a few frequencies. So there was a linear system that captured that reasonably well, and DMD found that linear system. So a question I'd like to pose is, can DMD say anything about truly nonlinear systems? Uh, and it turns out that it can. And we'll look at something called the Koopman operator. So what is the Koopman operator? Well, it's a linear operator uh, that describes the full dynamics of, a, of a, even a fully nonlinear system, but not through linearization. So I'll show you how it works. Um, so let's say we have a nonlinear system, a discrete time system here. 
xk plus one equals f of xk. So we're going to consider functions of the state x. And the Koopman operator will act on functions of x, like complex valued functions of x. So if you take a function g, g of x is a complex, g is a complex valued function, u will map g into a new function, ug. And ug at x is just g of f of x. That's just composition. That's all this operator is. Um, composition with f. So this is a linear operator, because if you look at u acting on the function alpha g1 plus beta g2, that's just alpha u of g1 plus beta u of g2. That's how function composition works. So if it's a linear operator, it could have eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, uh, lambda j being the eigenvalues and phi j being the eigenfunctions. Now, it turns out that, that DMD can, be, uh, can, can compute what DMD computes for a nonlinear system like this is something called these we called Koopman modes, where if you take a vector valued, a vector valued observable function, say a vector of such functions, you could expand each component of this. Uh, ooh, sorry, I messed up there. Uh, you could expand each component of this as uh, in terms of these eigenfunctions, assuming you have enough eigenfunctions, uh, and that would have coefficients vj, uh, vj component of vj. If you stack these up into a vector, the, the, those coefficients are become vector valued. And those coefficients are the Koopman modes that are actually calculated by the DMD algorithm. So this DMD is really tightly connected with uh, this Koopman operator. Okay, um, one really interesting feature of this Koopman operator is that it lets you determine linear models of a system without actually linearizing the system. And I wanna show you how this, uh, what, what I mean by that. Uh, so you can, so linear systems are very nice. We have lots of techniques for analyzing them, designing controllers for them. We can even deal with systems with very high dimension, like we looked at in the first part of this talk. But real systems, you know, are not, are not linear usually. So these Koopman eigenfunctions determine a very useful set of coordinates in which not, the nonlinear dynamics look linear. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. So let's, let's take this little map here. So little two-dimensional map. It maps x1, x2 into what you see there, lambda x1, comma, mu x2, plus that thing times x1 squared. So that system has an equilibrium at the origin. It's easy to see that if x1 and x2 are zero, then they'll stay at zero. And then it has some invariant manifolds you see there. And that little parameter c determines sort of how, how nonlinear it is. Notice that if c is zero, the, there's no coefficient in front of x1 squared. You just get a linear system. But if c is non-zero, then you get some curvature to that invariant manifold and it becomes uh, a nonlinear system. Well, the system has Koopman eigenvalues uh, and eigenfunctions. The, the eigenvalues are, are just lambda and mu, those parameters in the system. And the eigenfunctions are what you see there. Uh, and notice that the, the zero level set of, the, of uh, phi mu is exactly that invariant manifold. And if you look at other level sets, you get these gray lines. These are level sets of those two eigenfunctions. And these, you can view this as forming sort of a curved graph paper, uh, which can determine then coordinates of the state of the system. And if you use those coordinates, just the, the values of those Koopman eigenfunctions, uh, just map to that, that little nonlinear change of variables at the bottom, in those coordinates, the dynamics are linear and they're even decoupled. So Z1 maps to lambda Z1 and Z2 maps to mu Z2. So these Koopman eigenfunctions determined a very helpful set of coordinates that just linearize the system. You can think of this as like diagonalization, but for a nonlinear system. Now you can't always do this, but uh, if you have enough Koopman eigenfunctions, then you can do this. Okay, so how do you compute Koopman modes? Well, we've seen that uh, DMD can compute these things. So uh, the, the message here is gonna be, you need to be a bit careful. This is how you, this is just how the, the algorithm works. You can uh, compute these DMD modes. Uh, this is one way of doing it. You can compute this matrix a uh, and uh, find eigenvalues of a. Uh, okay, so this is a way of computing Koopman modes. What I want to show you is that uh, this doesn't always work for nonlinear systems. So there's an extension of this where you approximate the Koopman operator directly, uh, and then you obtain these Koopman eigenvalues modes and eigenfunctions. So I should have emphasized on the previous slide that the, the DMD finds these Koopman modes, but it doesn't actually tell you the Koopman eigenfunctions which here is what we wanted to find out. So this extended DMD lets you compute these eigenfunctions. Uh, what you need to feed it, in addition to the data, is a set of observables, some functions. These are just 
real or complex value functions, which will serve as basis functions for a function space, a, a subspace of a function space on which we'll project this Koopman operator. Okay, so then this ED, extended DMD, which we call EDMD, is just a projection of the Koopman operator onto the, the subspace spanned by those observable functions. So let's just illustrate this for this example. So here's back to this example we just showed. Remember, you had these two uh, Koopman eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Uh, I just also wanted to point out that if, uh, if lambda is an eigenvalue, then lambda squared is also an eigenvalue. And lambda times mu is also an eigenvalue with eigenfunctions just uh, as the product of the eigenfunctions too. It's just a feature of this operator. So let's try to compute these uh, uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions using uh, EDMD. Uh, the other thing I want to remind you here is this parameter C uh, controls how nonlinear the system is. If C is zero, it's not, it's, it's a linear system, right? And if C is non-zero, it's a nonlinear system. Okay, so let's apply DMD to this example. Let's take some, that's only four data points we're, we're taking here, some initial states, uh, and there's the values of lambda and mu that we'll use. Well, if we apply uh, uh, EDMD with this, uh, uh, so we need to say what we're gonna measure. So let's say we observe here Z1 and Z2, the full state. Okay, we'll apply DMD to this or extended DMD to this. If C is zero, this nonlinear nonlinearity parameter, uh, then the DMD eigenvalues are spot on, 0.9 and 0.5, which is exactly what uh, we expect that those are the correct eigenvalues. But if C is one, so there's some nonlinearity, then the DMD eigenvalues are 0.9, that one's good, but the second one is two, and that's nowhere close, it should be 0.5. Uh, in fact, for this discrete time system, we'd even get the stability wrong, right? 0.5 would be is less than one, so that would be a stable discrete time system. Two is greater than one, so that would be an unstable discrete time system. So we'd even get the wrong stability of this nonlinear system if C is one. Okay, so this didn't work very well, and we observed the whole state there, Z1 and Z2. Well, what if we now observe uh, three things, Z1, Z2, and also Z1 squared? And you might say, well, that's that's silly. Why would you want to, you're already measuring Z1. Why would you also measure Z, Z1 squared? If you know Z1, you can figure out Z1 squared. Well, that's right. But the idea is here, these are supposed to be functions of a state. And this is now, so the first function is uh, just the function that returns Z1, you know, takes Z, returns Z1. The second function takes Z, returns Z2. The second function takes the vector Z and returns Z1 squared. So now we have three functions in our function space. So it seems silly to add this third variable, but it makes sense if you regard these as functions. So if you take these as the observables, then the EDMD eigenvalues are spot on, right? We get 0.9 and 0.5, and the third one is 0.81, which is 0.9 squared, which is, these are all, uh, uh, you know, actually real, uh, you know, analytically determined Koopman eigenvalues. And okay, so the main point is, so this works well. So the main point is for a nonlinear system, if you do just DMD by itself, it can give erroneous results. It can give you eigenvalues that are not uh, always corresponding to Koopman eigenvalues. Uh, and you often need a richer set of these observable functions. So let's try this out on some more interesting uh, nonlinear systems. So here's the Duffing equation. Uh, again, just two states here. The states are X and X dot. Uh, where, so Y as shown in the figures is, is just X dot. And we've tried uh, EDMD on this system with a lot of data. So we have a thousand trajectories with 11 points along each trajectory. This trajectories are solutions of the system for different initial conditions. What basis functions do we use? Well, here we used a thousand radial basis functions. Uh, here, thin plate splines uh, centered at uh, points at a thousand different points in the domain uh, determined by an algorithm, this k-means clustering algorithm. So uh, if we use those thousand basis functions, then we find eigenfunctions as shown. So the first uh, eigenfunction is the constant function. Uh, and that's, that's always an eigenfunction of the Koopman operator. The second one reveal is, is shown at the figure at the bottom left, uh, le level sets of that uh, eigenfunction. And that reveals these two basins of attraction. So this Duffing equation has three equilibria. One is unstable at the origin, zero, zero. And then two in the, since my pointer's gone, I can't point to them, but they're in the, in the centers of those uh, uh, to uh, red and blue blobs there. And those are stable equilibria for this, uh, for positive delta. Um, so, okay, so the red and blue regions indicate the 
uh, sort of demarcate the region, the basins of attraction of each of these equilibria. Uh, the plot at the right shows all the points that are mislabeled. So if we use that eigenfunction, that uh, calculated eigenfunction to label the points by which basin, which equilibrium they end up at, the only points that are mislabeled are those green ones that are right on the boundary that are very difficult to, to sort out correctly. Okay, how about the other eigenfunctions? So the first eigenfunction determined the basins of attraction. The, the next one determines coordinates in each basin in which the dynamics are linear. So on the left, we're showing the magnitude of, so top left is the magnitude of the second eigenfunction. And this is like a radial coordinate uh, for, around that uh, rightmost equilibrium at x equals one. Uh, and the on the top right, you see an angle coordinate. These are just like action angle variables for this nonlinear system uh, in the, in the uh, base of attraction of that equilibrium at x equals one. And the other eigenfunction at the bottom shows the same thing for the equilibrium at x equals minus one. So these are, you know, just uh, magnitude and complex phase of these Koopman eigenfunctions that determine these nice uh, handy coordinates in which the dynamics are linear. Okay, so this seems to work well. Uh, but this is not really an ideal method to use for complicated systems. This example I showed you was a two-dimensional uh, ODE, right? We want to apply these to high-dimensional problems like fluids with, you know, many more than two states. Uh, and just to show you the, and, and even for that two-dimensional system, I used a thousand basis functions. Uh, so if you have 400 states is not a lot for a fluids problem, but if you have only 400 states, if you cho choose the basis, basis functions for EDMD to be all monomials in these 400 variables up to degree 10, well, that's 10 to the 19 functions. And that's much, much too large for easy computation. Um, uh, so one idea to make this uh, method work in higher dimensions is to use kernel functions. So this is a trick from machine learning. Uh, this method, this extended DMD method, only requires inner products in the high dimensional space. Uh, high dimensional meaning dimension K, the 10 to the 19 dimensional space. Uh, so if all you need is inner products, then you can use a kernel function, uh, which uh, has associated with it a feature map. So there's a feature map that maps you from your state space, 400 variables, to the feature space, 10 to the 19 variables. Uh, and you don't ever explicitly use that feature map. The idea is to avoid working in the high dimensional space. Instead, but instead you can compute inner products in that feature space by just using a, a kernel function, which just acts on the state space, the smaller dimensional, 400 dimensional space. And this is, gives you a potentially huge computational savings, uh, order, order n, order 400, instead of order k, 10 to the 19. So these kernel functions can, can be a help. It's still, however, a very difficult problem to determine good kernel functions and good, uh, you know, good uh, basis, uh, good sets of basis functions for EDMD. Really a, a difficult problem. Uh, as for these high dimensional systems, but here's one trick that you can use to make it a bit more tractable. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about uh, DMD and Koopman operator. Uh, now I wanna shift gears and talk about this uh, T-junction flow. And here, the tools I'm gonna to look at are just stability and bifurcations. But I think this is a very interesting flow that I'm, I'm excited to tell you about. There are some features that were very surprising to me at least. Uh, so it's just flow at a T-junction. So it's a common piping element, you know, at these small scales in a lab, bigger scales in processing. Uh, and it occurs over, I mean, this, this practical thing uh, uh, is, uh, you know, it occurs in a lot of situations, even inside your body, in your blood vessels in your body. There are lots of these T-junctions. So this is joint work with Howard Stone and Kevin Chen, uh, who was a student of ours. Um, and I, I, uh, this is, I think before these folks looked at this, I don't think this was a, this phenomenon had been seen before. So here's the geometry. There's flow uh, down through the inlet and then flow out through both sides. Um, and there's a Reynolds number associated with this. So what happens in this flow? Uh, I'll show you this movie. Uh, this is uh, one of Howard Stone's postdocs, uh, Daniele uh, Vigolo uh, took this movie and they were looking at the effect of, of particles in these flows. So those black dots you see in the movie are uh, solid particles. And they were looking at how these impact the wall. These particles are more dense than the fluid. And they thought, well, okay, it'd be easy to, it'd be interesting to look at what happens if you replace the particles by bubbles that are less dense than the fluid. And here's what they saw. 
a very surprising phenomenon. They saw these bubbles start to collect near the center of this T-junction. Uh, this was very surprising. This is not at all what I would think would happen. I would think the bubbles would just flow out the two sides, but they found that many of the bubbles did not actually flow out the two sides. They collected in the middle. They were sort of trapped. Uh, okay, they vary the geometry. They change the angle. Uh, it does depend on Reynolds number. So at Reynolds number 250 at the left, there's no trapping. Uh, at the Reynolds number 450 at the right, there is trapping. So very surprising that these bubbles would be somehow trapped. I would never have guessed that. Uh, okay, so we wanted to understand this. So there's been a lot of studies on flow in curved pipes or curved tubes. It's called Dean flow. Uh, and you see these uh, centrifugal uh, uh, effects uh, create these two vortices in this flow. I at the left denotes the inner, uh, inner wall, the inner curvature. Uh, o is the outer wall, the outer side of the curve. And you see the centrifugal effects just uh, uh, sort of fling the particles toward the outer wall and create these two vortices. So this is a very well-known well, well phenomenon. Uh, and we observe similar effects in this T-junction uh, flow. Uh, OK, so here's some three-dimensional features of these. So I'm showing uh, the yellow region shows the Q criterion, which is a way of visualizing uh, vortical structures in these flows. And then the stream tube showed uh, particle traces. And you see some of these particles get trapped. And some of the particles uh, move out of the, of the T-junction. Some get trapped inside these yellow regions. Um, so it's in these, uh, you see the closed streamline inside the yellow region. This is a signature of something called vortex breakdown, uh, which is a, has an interesting feature that there's a stagnation point uh, internal to a flow, not at a wall. So, so we all know what a stagnation point is. If you have a flow impinging on a wall, you'll get a stagnation point uh, somewhere in the middle there that separates the flow going up from the flow going down. But you can also have a stagnation point internal to a flow, which is what happens in our flow here. So the stagnation point is right at the end there. Uh, and this is a, sort of an unusual phenomenon. Uh, but it does happen in other situations. For instance, this flow, flow past this aircraft wing, you see the little white uh, cloudy vortex being shed from the, the little uh, wing. Uh, and then it sort of balloons up at the, at the back of the, as the vortex evolves downstream. So that's this phenomenon called vortex breakdown. And this has been well studied. Here's, here's an experiment uh, by Leibovitch in 1978 showing the same phenomenon. The, the thin vortex uh, expands into a thick vortex like that. And there's a stagnation point right at that location. Here's a study from uh, Phil Holmes in the 1980s did a, a study of the, the dynamics of trajectories in this flow. And you see these stagnation points at locations A and B uh, in this flow. So this, this is actually what is happening in this T-junction flow. You get a stagnation point internal to the flow, uh, and it's a hallmark of this recirculation. OK, so we wanted to look at the stability of this system and how, how it uh, changes as you vary the Reynolds number. And what we find is that for uh, low Reynolds numbers, there's no recirculation. Right? This is what the flow looks like for very small Reynolds numbers. As you increase the Reynolds number, OK, the streamlines become more interesting, but still no recirculation. At some point, you start getting these, those yellow regions, again, are denoting the Q criterion. Uh, and this is a way of visualizing uh, the vortical structures. Uh, there may or may not be recirculation there. But at some point, these structures grow in, in size. And one definitely has recirculation inside of them. Uh, we didn't focus so much on the recirculation as what happens as you increase further. Uh, at some point, you get a hop bifurcation in this equilibrium here becomes unstable, and these structures start to oscillate and warble. Uh, and you get even subsequent Hopf bifurcations. Each, each square there denotes uh, another Hopf bifurcation. Oh, I should have pointed out the three curves are uh, different radii of curvature at the junction. So the junction could be have zero radius of curvature, so just a sharp corner, or some curved, uh, curved wall there at the junction with some radius. So here's just a movie showing the uh, unsteady flow after the hop bifurcation. So here's, here's the structure. Uh, but the, and for lower Reynolds numbers, the structure is just steady. But for a higher Reynolds number, the structure starts to warble like this and oscillate. And that's, that's what happens at a hop bifurcation. You get this periodic orbit. Uh, so this is precisely what we observe in the, in the experimental data, too. 
okay, you can also use this linear stability theory to analyze these, these structures as they warble. These are the eigenmodes at the frequency of the off bifurcation showing how this uh, meanders, these structures in this, uh, the, the red and blue structures you see there. Uh, you can also look at the uh, adjoint eigenmodes, which show you where perturbations will most effectively excite that eigenmode. And you see you're most sensitive to places at the wall. So if you wanted to influence that in some way, you could uh, perturb the wall, perturb the flow near the wall there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the third uh, topic I wanted to show you. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish with this discussion of the separation bubble. And in particular, I want to talk about a method um, called the harmonic resolvent, which we've used to analyze this uh, the um, unsteady uh, unsteadiness in this separation bubble. Uh, okay, so here's the, the problem I'm looking at here. Uh, we have a, a, a boundary layer, just a Blasius boundary layer, which we then impose an adverse pressure gradient on to cause the boundary layer to separate. Uh, and uh, we're working with some experimentalists. You see the, my collaborators down below, uh, Charles Minivo, Rajat Mittal at Johns Hopkins, and Wen Wu. Uh, and we're trying to control this flow and ideally reduce the size of the separation bubble. And there's some actuators you see. Uh, we want to ask questions what, such as what frequency is best to actuate these, uh, these, uh, these zero net mass flow actuators. Uh, there are several frequencies present in the flow. We want to know how these frequencies interact with one another. So we want to capture these nonlinear interactions between the frequencies that are present in the natural flow and also the forcing frequency that we might impose here. So how could we capture nonlinear interactions between frequencies? Well, I want to say a little bit about what resolvent analysis is. Uh, so if we have some, say, a nonlinear system shown there, uh, so what you can do is you can consider perturbations about some base flow here I'm denoting the base flow to be capital Q. So one often takes the base flow to be the, the mean of a turbulent flow, for instance. So you linearize about that. There are the linearized equations and H, H prime denotes the leftover terms the, from, from the nonlinear part. Okay, well, if you Fourier transform that equation, then the DDT turns into an I omega and you get this, uh, this equation down there at the bottom left, which relates the perturbations H hat to the, the uh, the perturbed state Q hat. Okay, so that operator there, the inverse of I omega I minus A, that's called the resolvent operator at frequency omega. And if you analyze that operator, you can look at, uh, for instance, its eigenvalues or its singular values and singular vectors, and those will describe the amplification of perturbations at frequency omega. Okay, so that's, that's how this resolvent analysis uh, works. It's just linearization and then looking at singular values and singular vectors. And this has been used uh, very effectively by uh, two of the main references are down below. Okay, so some difficulties with this is that this uh, is very good at capturing the amplification of disturbances at one frequency omega, but it doesn't say anything about nonlinear interactions between frequencies. And that's one thing we wanna uh, capture here. Also the perturbations Q prime might be large and we might be interested in how those larger perturbations evolve. So an idea you can consider is to consider something called a harmonic resolvent. So instead of linearizing about a fixed base flow, capital Q, what if you let Q uh, vary in time? So make Q a periodic orbit. So that's shown in the picture here, rather than linearize about the, the red dot, a fixed flow, you could linearize about the black periodic orbit. And then if you're, for, for instance, if, you have the, if your trajectory is the blue curve, well, the blue curve is closer to the black curve than it is to the red dot. And the perturbations Q prime are smaller than they would be if there were perturbations from the red dot. And in addition, you could capture something about nonlinear interactions. Uh, and I'll show you why you get nonlinear actions when you linearize about a periodic orbit. So now instead of writing the, the full uh, flow Q as a fixed base flow, capital Q, plus a perturbation, we'll let the base flow Q be periodic with some period. Uh, and we'll also consider periodic perturbations, Q prime. So we'll expand both of those in some Fourier modes. So NB is the number of Fourier modes in the base flow, and N is the number of Fourier modes in the perturbation. Uh, they might be different. You might have different numbers of Fourier modes there. Uh, so if, now if you linearize about Q of T, the resulting equations will couple different frequencies through the base flow. 
uh, you'll get terms that multiply the perturbations in the base flow, and those multiplications will will uh, will give you coupling between the two frequencies. So, just for instance, if you take just one Fourier mode of the base flow, uh, so sinusoidal base flow, and then two Fourier modes in the perturbations, you'll get coupling terms that look like this. So, this matrix at the left is actually the inverse of the res harmonic resolvent operator, but you'll see it has a very nice structure. Uh, now each, what are those things? Well, uh, R sub omega is the regular resolvent operator at frequency omega. So if you take just, just one frequency, for instance, in the base flow, then this would be just what you'd have only one block in the left matrix. And that would be the inverse of the, of the original resolvent operator. But now we'll get these coupling terms. And of course, when you take the inverse of that matrix, it still it will have, it'll be a full matrix. It won't even have that uh, block tridiagonal structure. So you'll get a lot of interactions between frequencies, uh, between the different frequencies. Okay, so the inverse of that matrix on the left is the harmonic resolvent, and that'll describe interactions between uh, frequency omega and its harmonics. So, okay, H denotes that harmonic resolvent, and it, it uh, tells us the response to perturbations at the different uh, harmonic, the harmonics of the basic, of the frequency of the base flow. And questions we're interested in. So what is, for instance, the input? Now it's a space-time input, because it has frequencies in it, as well as uh, a spatial variation. What is the input that excites the most energetic response? Uh, and then what's the forcing input at frequency, at a particular frequency alpha, that excites the most energetic response at some other frequency, omega. Right now that we have nonlinear interactions between frequencies, we can have interactions like that. And both of these can be answered by looking at H, and in particular at singular value decomposition, or just of one of its subblocks. So I'll show you first on a little model problem and then on the boundary layer problem. So here's flow past an airfoil at a high angle of attack, so the flow is separated, and there's some vortex shedding behind it. Uh, now at the right is shown the, the spectrum of the, uh, of, the shed, of the vortex shedding. And you see there's a fundamental frequency 2.4 and then many harmonics of that in the shedding. So what we'll do is we'll, we wanna look at perturbations of this and see how perturbations affect the overall flow. So we'll compare uh, two different base flows. The first is linearizing about the steady, just the mean, which is the standard resolvent analysis. And this, we'll compare that against uh, linearizing about the a periodic orbit with containing three harmonics. That's the harmonic resolvent. We'll then compute the SVD of that and compare the response with the observations from the full simulation. So how does that look? Well, at the left is the Fourier coefficients of the full nonlinear simulation. So that's, that's the truth. Um, the middle is the resolvent modes from the, the periodic base flow. And that looks very similar to the truth. At the right is the resolvent modes from the steady base flow. And that looks actually pretty different. I mean, you, if you look at it, the, de the details are quite wrong uh, when you look at that closely. Uh, how about at frequency two omega? So there are the, at the left are the, the, is the truth, and the middle is the resolvent modes about the periodic base flow. And at resolvent modes, we get a, a re really just noise. There's not, uh, there's not much response there in the, in, the, in, the re in the resolvent about the steady base flow. So that's, we're really just looking at noise there. Uh, at three omega, we get similar, very good response from the periodic base flow. Uh, but, and there's just no, uh, the, it's just complete noise for the resolvent. Okay, so that's, that's response at the same frequency. How about nonlinear interactions between frequencies? So now if we take that resolvent operator, which is now you could think of as like a, a block diagonal, or a, sorry, with several different blocks in it here, maybe 15 blocks if we have seven harmonics. So 15 times, we have the, the size of this is actually quite large. Each block has the dimensions of the resolvent operator and we have 15 by 15 blocks. But we can look at the maximum singular value of each block and that will tell us how much coupling there is between forcing at a particular frequency. So at the, the horizontal axis is the forcing frequency and the vertical axis is the frequency of the response. And wherever you see the darkest blocks, you get the biggest response. So this tells us that forcing at higher frequencies doesn't give us much of a response, but forcing at say the fundamental frequency one, uh, one omega, the same frequency as the vortex shedding, gives us a response that couples to many of the different frequencies of this, uh, of this uh, flow past the airfoil. 
Okay, so finally, let's apply this to this turbulent separation bubble. Uh, I described this earlier. There's an adverse pressure gradient that causes the separation. And in these uh, numerical experiments that Wen Wu did, they were forcing at three frequencies uh, the fundamental frequency of this uh, uh, vortex shedding bubble, and then two and a half times that and 10 times that. And what they observed in the simulations was that uh, if you force at the low frequency, this will shrink the separation bubble, but high frequencies had no effect. Uh, and if you forced it frequency at the frequency of the separation bubbles uh, shedding, that caused an energetic response at the same frequency. So we wanted to look at this uh, same flow using the harmonic resolvent. Uh, and what we did here was we, uh, we actually did a span-wise averaging of this data. So we had only 2D, two-dimensional uh, data, but we looked at three-dimensional perturbations of this. And we considered this uh, breathing frequency that was identified in the simulations, and we, and we uh, took one harmonic and linearized about that uh, periodic phase flow at that frequency. Okay, and then we looked at the harmonic resolvent. Now I'm showing only a quarter of this matrix and that the matrix is symmetric, so it has the symmetry. So you can look at only one quarter of the matrix, but this tells us the sensitivity of this flow to forcing at different frequencies by looking at the maximum singular value of each block. So we looked at uh, 10 harmonics of this. And what we see is that uh, so again, the horizontal axis, think of that as the forcing frequency, the vertical axis is the response frequency. So that, and frequency zero is of course the mean, the turbulent mean separate. And we see that the, the mean separation bubble, which is in, in blue, that's affected by low frequencies. That if you force at frequency zero or frequency one, you'll have an impact at this. Frequency two and three, you have some lesser impact on the mean separation bubble. But if you force at frequency 10, then 10 F, then you have basically no effect on the separation bubble, on the mean separation bubble, right? So if you, in fact, you don't have, have effect on any of, the, any of the flow if you force at such a high frequency. But if you force at frequency F, then you excite an energetic response. The biggest, the, the darkest block there is at one FL. So you have the biggest response at the same frequency, but also response at twice the frequency and also steady mean. So we can, and we can look at the structures uh, that emerge there too. Um, and uh, the, the, the singular vectors uh, show the, the structures that are, um, that are excited by this. Okay, so this gave us qualitative agreement with observations from the direct numerical simulation, uh, even though we're looking at only spanwise average flow like that. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the talk. So we looked at these four different flows and we looked at uh, several different techniques for finding simplicity in these flows you know ranging from projection of the dynamics to DM, uh, dmd dynamic mode decomposition linear stability and uh, finally this harmonic resolvent analysis um, so i'll wrap up there i do want to acknowledge all the students and postdocs and collaborators who worked on this and uh, funding from the air force and the national science foundation uh, and that's all i'd be happy to take your questions Great, thank you. Thank you, Clancy, for a very, very nice talk. Big overview, lots of material. I'm sure there's lots of questions. One that actually came up during the talk, uh, I'm gonna ask on behalf of uh, Emily Southern, her internet connection is not so good. So she's asking about uh, on slide 24, when Z1 squared is added to the EDMD, what happens, for example, if you add Z2 squared or naively adding a whole library of extra functions so she's thinking in the in the direction yeah. of Cindy. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Really excellent question. So if you add Z2 squared, it won't do any harm. Um, it won't, but if you did Z2 squared instead of Z1 squared, then you actually wouldn't get a benefit. Um, so why Z1 squared? You can still see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's, um, yeah, let me just make this bigger so it's easier to see. Okay, so uh, why, Z1, why was Z1 squared the right thing to do? Well, we knew beforehand actually that uh, this was the correct Koopman eigenfunction. The correct Koopman eigenfunction had a Z1 squared in it. Uh, and that's why Z1 squared is the right thing to include here. So if you think about, you know, uh, if you have the function Z1, if you have the function Z2 and the function Z1 squared, then you can represent both of these as superpositions of those three functions. Right, um, so that's why z1 squared was the right thing to add here. If you added z2 squared, uh, 
that wouldn't help you get this function here, right? You'd, you'd still get this one wrong. Uh, so yeah, it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, get any penalty if you added that um, in addition to Z1 squared. Well, maybe you wouldn't, I guess you'd still get these three correct. You, the, you might get, you would get a fourth eigenvalue, which might be wrong because uh, there would be no eigenfunction. The next eigenfunction that would involve Z2 squared would be the square of this thing, which would also have a Z1 to the fourth term in it, and also Z1 squared times Z2. So that if you wanted to get a further eigenfunction, the, the next things you would add would be not just Z2 squared, but also Z2 times Z1 squared and Z1 to the fourth. If you so did if that, you, then you'd get- If you add that one, would you then get an additional eigenvalue of 0.25? You'd get an eigenvalue of mu squared, which is point two exactly. Yeah. That's exactly okay. But right. if you add only z two squared, you wouldn't get one in one two five uh, point two five. You get some crooked one. You get some crooked. That's right. You get one that doesn't make any sense. So yeah, you know, some of these eigenvalues would be legitimate, accurate eigenvalues, and some would be inaccurate. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Good. That's an excellent question. Yeah. If you have any other questions, just unmute yourself, and while you think about one, let me squeeze one in. Um, yeah. Uh, for the harmonic uh, resolvent, Clancy, uh, you 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 go for frequency to frequency, so input to output, forcing to response, right? But uh, often when we do flow analysis, uh, nonlinear flow analysis, or weakly nonlinear flow analysis, there is actually two paths. One is going through a mean flow that would be of zero frequency, and one is going directly from perturbation to perturbation. Could you actually separate those two out by using masking matrices or something like that? Oh, that's a great idea. Um, by blocking certain pathways. Yeah, yeah. The, oh, that's an excellent. I have not even bracket. thought about that. But I meant you certainly could. I mean, if, if you took this matrix and just, so I think you're saying just mask out some of these. Exactly, uh, exactly, uh, yeah. 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 Well, that's a and great this way, idea. That's, this way yeah. you can do one pathway and then you do the other pathway and then you can decide which one is bigger. They all have to sum up to, to the same energy transfer. Yeah, what a great one, suggestion. One pathway could suck energy out while as the other one is actually putting more in. So in net, you get mm -hmm. what, what you showed us. Yeah, and that would really let you un understand in a lot more detail yeah. the, the fundamental flow mechanisms going yeah, on. Yeah, you could dissect it a little bit better. Yeah, yeah that's an excellent suggestion. Yeah. I mean, I guess in a way we did that by just uh, comparing the, um, uh, I mean, a very primitive version of that is just to mask out this, these uh, uh, off diagonal blocks altogether. And then you're looking yeah. at just the plane resolvent. You're yeah, neglecting like all pathways through the mean flow. But yeah, you're saying you could do a much more uh, fine tuned uh, analysis of that. Yeah, 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 that's a great suggestion. Yeah, yeah. good. Any questions from the participants? Just just uh, unmute the microphone and fire away. Hello. Hello. Andrew Hazel here, I have, a, I, have a, I have a question. So following up on what we were talking about, about the harmonic resolvents, when you presented the comparisons with the, or maybe it was the one before with the G-junction. Anyway, you can pre presented comparisons with the steady um, cases versus the periodic, and the steady was fairly rubbish. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, did you did you look at the mean of the periodic flow versus the steady? What I'm getting at here is how much steady streaming was there going on, and was that the effect that you weren't capturing with the steady flow? Okay, let me try to make sure I understand your question. So, so you want to look at the mean? The of mean the... of the periodic flow is not yeah. necessarily when you've got nonlinear effects is yeah. not necessarily the same as the the steady the mean of the that's right. Yeah. So you're saying Could that you... the the perturbation, say at frequency omega, may affect the mean flow. Absolutely. It's yeah. it's basically because cos squared can be rewritten as a half plus a half cos two t. So you get this mean contribution. Yeah. Ah, uh, you know, streaming I, or acoustic streaming or anything like that. I think we did look at that. Of course, yeah. that effect would not be present in the in the linearization about the steady base flow. Absolutely. But it uh, it will be. There will be an effect there. Actually, maybe you can see that. Here, okay, so there is an effect because this is this is that same flow. I, I guess I didn't show the plot here, but there is an effect here because this is the this shows if you force at frequency omega, there is an yeah. effect on the mean flow here. Absolutely. Um, but I didn't plot that picture. I can't. I didn't show you what the effect was. 
but there is an effect there. Yeah. Okay. I guess I was just wondering is if that's the dominant effect, if there's anything else going on, do you know? Yeah. Um, well, it certainly has a big singular value. One of the biggest singular values yeah. here. Um, so it is, it may be, that is the dominant effect. I mean, to be honest, we were, weren't so interested in studying the, the flow physics of this problem. We were more using it as a, a, t a test problem to kind of understand the tools we were using. Um, but I sure. think that's a good thing to just go back and look at what the effect on the mean was. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There is actually in the meantime, a, a, a comment or a question from Jonathan Mestel in the, in the chat. Uh, when surgeons make bypass grafts, they typically take a piece of vein and splice it into another vessel. When they make a T-junction, they often observe end-to-side anastomosis. Reblockage occurs in time. This can be avoided by having the incoming tube at an angle or recommended twist in the third dimension. And I think Andrew Hazel worked on this one too. Oh, wow. So can you... Yeah, I did. That's partly what motivated the question. The, ah, uh, wonderful. The, the okay. conclusion I came to there was that you one of the dominant effects was you got a massive shift in the position of the time average stress field precisely because of these streaming effects mm -hmm. so you could you could get the the uh, the oscillations would would change the patterns and that was consistent with the directions where they saw this gunk building up so basically you get gunk building up in your arteries, even though there's a periodic flow near the walls when they have these types of junctions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Yeah, that's interesting. So you say you break the symmetry by having them come in at an angle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the real constraint the surgeons have is they just have to fit it how they can. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, essentially what they're interested in is straight versus angle, any precise details is really constrained by the anatomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Peter, may I ask? Uh, yeah, Shu Song, yeah. of course. Yeah, kind of probably uh, revisit the questions for the very first one. Uh, so, so for extended uh, DMD, you, you, you uh, introduce this observable, so, so what? In the general case, of like thinking the high dimension, so how do you? What's the guidelines for choosing the, in, you know, the the one that works, or whether in any sensor it's kind of optimal one, and how do you do it? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I knew. I mean, it, uh, I think there's no great general procedure for doing that. I mean, to be to be honest, I mean, I, mean, I think there are basic things you can do. If, you know, if you know something about um, the state space, you could, you could, in principle, choose good things. I mean, in this example, we, you know, we knew what the eigenfunctions were, so we knew what terms to choose. You know, often things that make sense to is to include uh, just monomials, like po polynomials in the states, just because you can approximate, you know, smooth functions with polynomials. Mm -hmm. So that's a starting point. And that's what some of these techniques like this uh, kernel net. So in this, in this example, we took uh, radial basis functions. We're trying to just uh, uh, describe general functions over this square. So radial basis functions is a reasonable thing to choose in that case. Um, but in high dimensions, that's, you're gonna have an awful lot of radial basis functions to choose. Um, so I think these are, these are, it's a very challenging thing doing this extended DMB, this, Koopman stuff. Could it uh, happen that if you do it, uh, you kind of, uh, non <laughs> you know, could it, could it, by introducing these extra observables, you can make things worse. It could be worse. You certainly could, yeah, yeah. Right, I mean, if, if you just do it in a haphazard way, uh, you can certainly make things worse, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, okay. with this, with these kernel methods that I showed, so this is another, Wait, you know, if, if you're going to just introduce uh, polynomials, monomials in these different variables, these kernel methods are a very nice way to do that efficiently. But of course, what happens is if you have a really high dimensional space you're working in, like this 10 to the 19 functions, well, you're going to overfit your data. You know, you don't have that much data. You have, you have many more, uh, say, parameters in your model than you have data points. You're going, to, you're going to fit all the noise in your data and not get a meaningful model. And I think that's part of one of what, what uh, 
you know, you said you can make things worse. Absolutely, you can make things worse by including so many basis functions that you can just, fit, you know, just like with polynomial interpret, interpolation, yeah, yeah. if you have a bunch of data points and fit an extremely high degree polynomial through it, you'll get nonsense because it'll just interpolate all the data perfectly, but overfit it. Exactly the same thing can happen here. Yeah, well, but I have a, a question probably can in general uh, in a similar sense. So with this uh, harmonic uh, resolvent, uh, so, so if you have a system, okay, flow in which uh, uh, there are lot of frequencies and uh, low and uh, high ones, and uh, they are also, you know, quite strong or pretty strong. How how do you separate the two? Which which one you introduce yeah. as a linear linear response? Others as a, as a kind of part of the base flow. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very challenging problem. And, and, and I'm certainly not trying to claim that the harmonic resolvent is the solution to every problem. Uh, I mean, I'm really considering a, a pretty simple situation where you have some uh, so for, periodic- yeah, For your specific one, so you choose the frequency, is the shading, or at the shading frequency or- Yeah, yeah, so- um, the... Yeah, so maybe if you look at here, there were all these different frequencies that are here. How did we choose this red one? Is that is that your yeah. question? I mean, there are certainly all but these frequencies. In a sense, is a dominant. Uh, it corresponds to the peak, yeah, spectrum peak, isn't it? It is the it is the strongest peak, but you know, as you correctly point out, there are many other frequencies here as well. I mean, this is a very complicated turbulence. Yeah, yeah, system. yeah. So they really could. Yeah, I mean. You know, they, here you should, other 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 harmonics kind of talk to each other through this uh, um, uh, the, the the components in the in the in the treated as part of base flow. But again, there is a you know those two those other frequencies uh, also talk to each other directly. They certainly do. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so it's nonlinear. That means this is you, you, what you described is more like kind of parametric resonance, right? You could so, think of it that way. Yeah. yeah. And then there's general nonlinear one. It's omega one, omega two. They can interact to produce omega one minus omega two, for example. Not just yeah. uh, okay, uh, a sum and the difference with the seeded. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so there is that part of that nonlinear interaction. That's Certainly, that's yeah. Not the model, right? right, right. The yeah. only interactions we're looking at are interactions between perturbations and the base flow, not perturbations and other perturbations. Yeah. Another way to look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. But if they are strong, can be important, I think. They, they may well be important. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Any, any more questions? Oh, there's a question in the chat about, uh, I wonder how you think oh. autoencoders might fit alongside the methods you've discussed. Uh, are yeah. Oh suitable? yeah, good one, yeah. Are they also suitable to certain problems or are they applicable to most problems? Well, that's a really good uh, observation. I think autoencoders can be quite useful. Uh, in fact, I have a student now who's looked at autoencoders for a problem like, like this one with the duffing equation. So, you know, here we used, we're trying to learn a function. We're trying to learn the, these eigenfunctions of this uh, system. Uh, and here we used, in this example, we used ba radial basis functions that we sort of uh, specified beforehand. But you could also think about tra training an autoencoder to learn these functions for you. Uh, and there's a, 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 some work that one of my students, Sam Otto, did uh, to, to apply autoencoders to this very problem. Uh, and it worked pretty well, actually. Uh, I mean, autoencoders are a great way of, of, of learning you know, uh, um, low dimensional kind of state variables that describe a high dimensional system. Uh, uh, and it turns out it worked very well for this, for this problem anyway. So I think they're very, uh, I think they fit alongside these methods very well. Good. Can I, can I squeeze one more in uh, now that I, I, I have you Clancy? Sure. Um, for the for the curl trick in the in the EDMD, is there any advantage of using instead of monomials using like Chebyshev polynomials to get around the overfitting or the more the more resolution power of mm -hmm. uh, of uh, of uh, orthogonal polynomials rather than just monomials? 
Yeah. Um, have you have you experimented I, with you know doing the kernel trick with Chebyshev functions or Chebyshev polynomials? You no, know, I haven't. And and they're made. I'm not sure what a kernel is that gives you Chebyshev polynomials. Um, uh, and it may not actually matter if the, I guess it would give you a different inner product. Yeah, I guess a different, so this, this feature, I, 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 I'm just wondering what the feature map looks like. I guess for your feature map, you're thinking map from state space to Chebyshev polynomials of certain exactly. degree. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I'm not sure what the kernel, I guess the difference is the kernel would, uh, uh, the inner product would be different, even though this, this feature space would be the same space mm -hmm. uh, because you have Chebyshev polynomials of the same degree, same number of variables would span yep. the same space as monomials, but a yep. different inner product that might be better. Yep. So I have not looked at that. Um, I think that's a great idea though. Because, maybe because a, you said if you, if you put that kernel idea, if you, if you introduce more and more, you know, you, you get into the overfitting. Well, we, yeah. we know that from polynomial interpolation, but the cure for that one is, is a different set, right? It's just, it's just mm -hmm. becoming more and more ill-conditioned. And yeah. the way we get yep. around that one is by switching to Chebyshev polynomials. And I was wondering whether that thing actually carries over to your kernel trick. Yeah, it may well do. I, I, I don't actually know. So there's a very easy kernel for, for monomials. Uh, it's just one plus x dot y to the power d, yep. if d is the maximum degree. Yep. Um, I don't know if there's a corresponding easy kernel for Chebyshev uh, polynomials, but maybe there is, and that could be a really easy thing to try. Yeah. So. Um, I will say there are other ways of kind of trying to um, get at this overfitting problem. With, I mean, just simply just having a regularization parameter that, that penalizes, um, you know, how many, how many say sparsity of your, uh, of your fit. Um, can, there are tricks like that that can be used. But, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that, anyway, that's a great suggestion, Peter. Thank you for that, yeah. Good. Any more questions from the attendees? Feel free to just unmute yourself and, and ask. No? All right. Well, thanks again, Clancy. Very nice talk. Very good overview of many different techniques. Super interesting. Thanks a lot. Well, thank